Hello, I'm Dr. Pamela Ruig, Extension Milk Quality Veterinarian for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And today, as part of our continuing series on mastitis pathogens, we're going to be discussing a very important mastitis organism called E. coli. If you're watching this video, you're probably already familiar with E. coli as a mastitis pathogen because it's an incredibly important cause of clinical mastitis occurring in dairy cattle. In fact, in one of our recent studies, we went out to 52 large Wisconsin dairy farms and collected milk samples from cows that were exhibiting signs of clinical mastitis. E. coli was the most common cause of mastitis in those cows and it occurred in a total of 22% of all of the cases. Now, E. coli is classified as a coliform, but it's not the only coliform. Other organisms such as Klebsiella, Serratia, and Enterobacter are also considered coliforms, but E. coli is the most frequent coliform that causes mastitis on most dairy farms. Now, similar to the other pathogens that we've been discussing in the series, we cannot diagnose E. coli mastitis simply based on looking at the symptoms in the cow. In order to achieve a diagnosis that the mastitis is caused by this organism, must take a milk sample from a cow and culture it on the appropriate media, either in an official diagnostic laboratory, in a veterinary clinic, or in some instances on an on-farm laboratory. E. coli grows on uh, typical medias that are used in microbiology laboratories and on-farm culture labs, and when it grows, it's a gram-negative organism. Um, that's important to recognize because gram-negative bacteria behave differently than gram-positive bacteria. Some of the things that they do differently is gram-negative bacteria um, have different ways they cause disease. Uh, for example, the gram-negative bacteria have a different uh, type of cell wall as compared to the gram-positive bacteria. That cell wall contains a substance that's technically called lipopolysaccharide, but we can also call that endotoxin. Remember that because some of the cows that have E. coli mastitis get really sick and when they get sick it's because what's happening is the um, cow's immune system is attacking those bacteria in the cow, bursting those bacteria and releasing the endotoxin from inside those gram-negative cell walls. So that's important to recognize. Um, gram-negative bacteria have different effects on the cow. Uh, uh, because they've got this endotoxin and because of other characteristics of the organism, they uh, elicit a very strong and effective immune response. This is important to recognize as well because in many cases, in an otherwise healthy cow, this immune response will be effective in clearing the bacteria. And when we do need to treat these with antibiotics, it's also important to recognize that because the cell wall is different, there's different targets for the antibiotics to work on. This is critically important to recognize because many of the intramammary antibiotics that are available for use in the United States for treatment of mastitis in cows simply do not have the ability to bind with gram-negative cell walls and therefore they're not effective in treating E. coli mastitis infections. This is also important for organic dairy farms to understand because on our organic dairy farms probably you're going to be quite successful in managing most of these cases without any use of any antibiotics at all. So this is one group of um, mastitis organisms that uh, there's, there's a lot of tools that don't require antibiotic therapy. As I said earlier, we have to remember that we can't diagnose E. coli mastitis just by looking at the symptoms in the cow. For about a third of the cows, the only symptom will be abnormal milk. We call these mildly affected or grade one cases of mastitis. For about another third of the cows, um, the greatest symptom that you'll see in the cow will be a swollen quarter. So in these cows, these moderate or grade two cases of mastitis, they would have abnormal milk and maybe a swollen quarter. And then in about a third of the cows, these cows will develop systemic signs of illness. That may include uh, large decreases in milk production. It could include fever. It could, could include um, a cow that, won't, that is tremendously off feed. Uh, or it could even include a cow that is um, in endotoxic shock where she's recumbent and can't get up. So um, we have to think about the fact that 
uh, this that E. coli mastitis can present with any variety of severity. And the risk factors for a cow becoming very ill would include things like heat stress, very high production, older cows, or the presence of other diseases. So again, the key take home message on this is E. coli can present in a large variety of presentations. So E. coli primarily causes clinical symptoms of mastitis and it's an uncommon cause of subclinical mastitis. In fact, there was some very early research done by the group at Ohio State in the mid-1980s that demonstrated about 85% of infections, uh, uh, utter infections, caused by E. coli last less than 30 days. And, and about the same percentage, about 81% of these subclinical uh, E. coli infections will eventually exhibit clinical signs. This is very different than um, mastitis caused by things like Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus. So again, uh, when we have a high somatic cell count that lasts for a long time in a cow, in most instances we wouldn't um, be highly suspicious that that infection is caused by E. coli. When we think about controlling uh, exposure of cows to E. coli pathogens, the key thing is to, think, to remember that these infections are what we call opportunistic. In other words, these uh, mastitis infections are caused by bacteria that live in the environment of the cows. So we classify E. coli mastitis as being an environmental mastitis pathogen. These organisms are present on every dairy farm and they cause mastitis when the exposure is sufficient enough to cause infection. And in most instances, because these organisms aren't adapted to living in the udder of cows, in most of the time, the cow's immune system will be successful in eliminating them. So in recent years, there's been quite a bit of controversy about uh, treatment of mild and moderate cases of clinical mastitis caused by E. coli. And, uh, I often get the question of, uh, do these cases of clinical mastitis actually require antibiotic therapy? And there's a few things to think about when you make this decision. First thing to consider is, do you have a culture result that indicates the case is E. coli? Because again, we can't recognize E. coli simply by looking at the symptoms in the cow. If we do know that it is E. coli, then the next step is to look at the characteristics of the cow. Is this the first case of mastitis, clinical mastitis, of this cow in this lactation? Is this an otherwise healthy cow? And has the somatic cell count of the cow generally been less than 200,000 cells per mil? These are the type of questions we need to ask. If the answer is yes, then often antibiotic treatment isn't necessary. The treatment can be what we call watchful waiting. Watch the cow discard the milk, and the milk should return to normal within four to six, to six days. As we're watching this cow, make sure she doesn't get uh, sicker, that the case doesn't progress, um, and the cow should continue to eat, and the milk should return to normal levels. However, if the answer to those questions is no, those are the type of cows where you may want to consider the use of antibiotic treatments. There are probably a few cases of E. coli mastitis where it's important that the cows do get antibiotics. The difficulty is deciding which cases require antibiotics and which cases don't. Here's a few clues to look at to help make that decision. Cows that have repeated cases of clinical mastitis may be good candidates for intramammary antibiotic treatment. The thing that's important to decide is what drug to use. Because remember, not all drugs can bind with gram-negative bacterial cell walls. The selection of the drug um, is important, and I recommend that you discuss that with your local veterinarian. The other types of uh, uh, cases of E. coli mastitis infections that may be um, appropriate for antibiotic treatment would be those few cases where the clinical case has been pre preceded by a long subclinical period. We can recognize that by seeing high somatic cell counts for a long period of time prior to the occurrence of abnormal milk. In those instances, again, appropriate intramammary antibiotic treatment is probably necessary. 
All right, I've been focusing on the treatment of these mild and moderate cases of clinical mastitis caused by E. coli. But remember, about a third of the cases, um, the cows are going to have, be very ill and have systemic signs. These cows need systemic treatment for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's a welfare issue. These cows are sick and they need to be treated properly. Secondly, cows with systemic disease um, have the possibility that the bacteria can spread from the udder to the, um, throughout the blood and really cause overwhelming um, bacteremia and illness in these cows. These cows um, should be treated with an appropriate treatment pro protocol that should be developed with your veterinarian. The components of these treatments for these cows should include supportive therapy to support the cardiovascular system of the cow, anti-inflammatories, in some instances pain relief, and appropriate antibiotics. I really encourage you to work with your local veterinarians to develop an appropriate treatment protocol for these cases. Prevention of uh, mastitis caused by E. coli is really focused on providing a clean and dry environment for the highest risk cows. High risk cows would include the fresh cows, the high producers, and many of the many instances the dry cows. We want to reduce exposure of the teats to moisture, mud, and manure that can be found in the surroundings of the cows. And uh, having a very clean, stress-free free environment is especially important during periods where the cows are exposed to heat stress. In our um, confinement operations, we want to make sure we don't overcrowd cows. And when we're milking those cows, we want to make sure that the milking technicians uh, know how to recognize and detect mastitis infections early. All right, let's just summarize the occurrence of mastitis caused by E. coli. This organism causes mastitis when teats are exposed to moisture, mud, and manure. Most E. coli mastitis is relatively short duration and in most instances it's spontaneously cured as a result of the cow's immune response. In many instances antibiotic treatments are not necessary for many of these mild and moderate cases of clinical mastitis caused by these organisms. But again we have to look at cow specific risk factors and it's especially important to recognize that some cows with recurrent cases of mastitis or long-term subclinical infections may benefit from antibiotic therapy. When we look at controlling mastitis, it's simply based on the principle of keeping cows clean, dry, and stress-free.